The title of today's podcast is The Importance of Rituals and Lessons Learned from COVID. We have with us our guests today, Drs. May and Tim Hindmarsh. Tim and May Hindmarsh are the hosts of BS Free MD Podcast. Both are board certified family practice physicians with almost 30 years of diverse experience in family practice, hospital medicine, and urgent care. They are a successfully married couple and are not afraid to have an honest and real discussion about what makes a relationship work. On their podcasts and in public speaking engagements, they discuss work-life balance and the four F's to success, faith, family, finances, fun. Their website is bsfreemd.com. Listen in. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Earrings Off. We want to invite you to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. You can find us on Facebook at Earrings Off Podcast and on Instagram at The Earrings Off Podcast. Welcome to Earrings Off. I'm Lou. And I'm Teresa. Let's get started. Welcome, doctors, to Earrings Off. Thank you so much for having us. We're delighted to be here. All righty. We're going to jump right into the questions. What are the four F's to success? So we we thought we were original with that. And then we were actually <laughs> interviewing someone else uh, one time on one of our podcasts who said that they heard someone come up with a similar thing. And I'm like, I thought we were original. But anyway, they probably they, stole it from you. They probably That's did. Right. They did. They absolutely, they so did. All right, we should have trademarked it anyway. <laughs> we, I mean, we honestly always have structured our lives in a way um since our marriage that really focuses first on faith um, for us, it's very important. And the basis for everything that makes us successful in our lives and our marriage um, family, um, which is the marriage that the two of us and then our children that we have um, finances, because um, money, as we all know, is a very important part of success or non success in marriages, business, anything. Um, and then fun because life is about fun and you work hard and you're, you know, together to have fun on this earth. And so, uh, that's the four F's that we live by. And we try to keep that order of priority when we, we make decisions, not, it doesn't always work that way, but, um, yeah, that's the, the four F's to a successful marriage and life. Well, since you two are, are very quite accomplished physicians, um, and I'm sure with that goes a lot of responsibility and very hectic days and a lot of having to make uh, decisions relative to your priorities. So when you say faith and family and finances and fun as the four F's to success, can you break that down a little bit and maybe share an example of that? Yeah. I mean, um, so I, I, first off, I think it's really important to understand what faith is and, you know, um, you know, we have a tremendous, you know, we're Christians and that's, that's our faith. Mm-hmm. And um, so are we lots of people that mm-hmm. aren't um, that listen to us. And I think it's really critically important for people to understand that everybody has a faith, whether they, they acknowledge it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of look at it as the filter through which you see everything else in life. It's sort of like the polarization in your sunglasses. And so, mm-hmm. you know, using scripture and the teachings of Christ is what is the filter that we've used to make all these other decisions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is balanced because it's never perfectly balanced by right. by any means um and so that made our decisions as far as family i mean we mm-hmm. can you know may would 100 percent agree with me we probably wouldn't have survived 18 or 19 <laughs> months let alone 30 years of marriage if it wasn't for our faith like there was wow. always a relationship that we had with god yeah. that was bigger than either of us yeah so wow. perfect example it was uh you know we were we got married four days after we graduated medical school. 
And the first six months to a year after was our kind of internship year, Mm -hmm. um, first year residency, the way our program was. But uh, I would say that, you know, if we were secular or like a lot of other friends and couples, honestly, I think a lot of people would have pulled the plug having the barriers and things going on that we did. I mean, there was times when (laughs) I think poor Tim was thinking, what was I doing? And if it wasn't for that, I promised this commitment like till death do us part (laughs) i'm out um and maybe it's maybe there should just be chalk circles around both of us (laughs) but there was a lot of struggles right away because we were i was still struggling with um an eating disorder depression Mm -hmm. um, anorexia bulimia i haven't really figured out my stuff i didn't even really want to be a doctor and i was finishing well starting a residency well we have this fresh marriage and it's like well what is that about um my sister moved in with us, um, because we, I promised my parents, I would help, Mm -hmm. you know, out with her. So she's much younger and she had her own struggles. And so then we have this other person living with us in the midst of a fresh, I mean, it was just, there was so much going on and it was really rough. Plus we're not seeing each other. We're sleep deprived every day. Uh, it was a tough time. And I think it would be easy for a lot of people just pack it in and, um, not that everybody would, but when we've had other bumps along the way, I mean, there was the seven year, not itch, but it was me that uh, was really struggling. And I had a moment where I said to Tim, poor Tim was off going to work one morning. And I said to him, as we have a toddler, I think it was a toddler. And maybe was I pregnant? I no, don't you, know. You, you were, I know exactly. <laughs> it's seared. It's seared in my consciousness. <laughs> like can't forget it. <laughs> on a Texas Longhorn. Yeah, no, I was, we were, <laughs> we're, re, we're completely remodeling our house. We're adding a, yes. a, a thousand square feet to it. We're, you know, we have this little acreage where we always wanted to live out in the woods and, you know, be mm. country doctors. And, and I'm literally have all my stuff packed to go to work. And she's like, I'm not sure I love you anymore. Mm. And, and I'm like, okay, well, let, you know, we'll have to table that discussion because I need to go to work. You're six months pregnant and we have a 15 month old. And as and as the, Tina Turner says, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Right. And, yeah. and oh, by the way, we're paying this crew of guys to like rebuild this house that is going to be like wildly over budget as every single project. Yeah. Is. So I yeah. said, you know, whatever. <laughs> and we joke about this now, but I mean, that that was actually one of two big major uh points in my life where I really struggled with things in our marriage and me and barriers. And I think it would have been, you know, I know friends, patients, other people that don't have faith and don't have a bigger picture in building blocks. And I mean, there's a lot of people that even do have faith that uh, struggle with working through this. And so Mm -hmm. it, it really was, that was the foundation in which I went back to. It's like, okay, what is what does God want me to do? I mean, what can we make this work? What is it within, you know, me that he seems to be happy? Why am I unhappy? What is it? You know, what's all this about? And instead of just being selfish and going, eh, I'm not happy. I'm out. There's got to be something better. Mm-hmm. Um, it really comes back to, I mean, this is just a really fast way to say it, but it really came back to the importance of faith. What I really believed at the core, what I had promised. Mm. Uh, um, mm-hmm. yeah, and I couldn't, yeah, I started with that. So, so we, the- that, that's just one, I mean, a, f- a couple examples of, yeah, there was a, those times in our, in my life, three times, you know, well, I'm sure for, for you with that residency, but where, you know, we've had t- nothing's perfect and to get to 30 years, which we are at now. Yes. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Faith, faith has really played a massive part in keeping the marriage together. And, and there's lots of other examples with things that we do at work, et cetera. Yeah. I love the response about faith being the filter because most people can understand that, that if you start with that, then you work, you understand that's your core and you try as best you can, particularly in marriage and relationships to see what you can do to make sure everything lines up with that. So thank you with that. Um, thank you for your honesty in uh, response to that. You know, yeah. and we, we, as we tell our kids and even <laughs> as we've told patients, friends, I mean, 
when you're partnering with someone, I mean, you have a some kind of internal belief system foundation base. You want to be connected and partner with someone that believes similar mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. because I mean, otherwise you're going two different directions. You're on yeah. buses or trains. Um, and, and how are you going to make it work when your core belief system doesn't even align together? I mean, I, I can't even imagine it'd be like being in a partnership of a business where you have two different objectives and ideas. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the marriage has always been that way. And for anybody, whether you're a Christian or not, what your core belief system is really has to align with your, your partner and how you raise your family and how you go about life. So that's why it's mm. the foundation for, I think, everything upon what you do. Mm. Okay. Thank so, you for that. Let, let me ask you something. Um, how, do you, how does that uh, play out with your clients? You mentioned uh, clients earlier. Do you share your beliefs um, with your clients? Patience. Patience. Uh, the, the, the long the and the patients. short answer is yes, but uh, we're obviously very sensitive to what mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. um, you know, what people need. Um, there's lots of times I've prayed with patients and I've, yeah. I have absolutely no idea what they believe. And I just said, hey, look, okay. I really feel like this is what I'm what I'm called to do. Mm -hmm. And I ask permission. And I think I, I think in the I don't know how many times I've done that. I have been I have been rebuffed once. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And yeah. And people just, it's interesting because no matter what they believe, they just, they really see it as you really care enough that you would actually expose sort of who you are to them. All mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which I think is a, I mean, from a human perspective is incredibly powerful. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. You know, if I met somebody of a completely different faith and they said, Hey man, I really care about you and I'm going to pray, pray for you every day. I mean, you'd say no. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. Right. I mean, unless they're sacrificing cats or something. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. One of the fastest things I learned too, and as we went into practice, because it's what we were always taught. Um, we did a, had a really good uh, psychiatry, psychology kind of background training in our, in our um, training system in medical school and the residency. But the thing I didn't agree with was it was always that whole detach yourself, you know, from the, from the patient, you're the outsider and you have to remain anonymous and don't share your personal things. You know, we had these really good interviewing type of skills that were taught. Mm -hmm. And as I, you know, started off on my own in practice and I'm like, you know, people well, mostly, I think because of who we were, the practice and small town that we were in, but people, I mean, want to know that their doctor is a real person. And I think that, like, as Tim said, people really respected when we would share personal experiences with them when it was appropriate, instead of just this sitting back as this right. objective observer and would say, you know, can I share with you? Yeah. I've gone through this personally myself and this has helped. And do you, uh -huh. you know, I would usually ask as well, you know, what is your belief system? Do you have a faith? Do you have a church faith? Do you have a community? Yes or no. And then, um, you know, as you dive more deep into that and feel safe, then, you know, I could get more personal with them. And so you get to kind of feel it out, but, right. um, I have no problem sharing things hmm. of myself when it's appropriate with patients. Cause they're like, Oh, this is cool. My doctor mm -hmm. gets me because yeah, she's, she's gone through stuff too. So yeah, we pray with patients a lot. I think the demographic that we're in lends to that of where we live as well, mm -hmm. but even in other areas that we've worked that don't, I think just learning to be sensitive to what, people right. Are. Right. Yeah. The, well, and it, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting sort of tightrope you walk because mm -hmm. sharing personal examples, I think is really powerful, but it has to come from the perspective of it's about the patient. It's not about yes. me. Yes. So right. it's not, Hey, you know, I had this great vacation. You should go on a right. vacation. It's right. really great. And the right. guy, you know, barely making it because right. he's battling right. drug abuse and lives in a single wide trailer with no plumbing. I mean, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a real sensitivity to right. the, because, right. because one way the patient sees it as this vulnerability that you're willing to walk in with them because you care about them mm -hmm. rather than I'm talking about me because I like talking about me. Right, right, right. Yeah. Excellent point. 
So let's talk a bit about um, grit versus talent. What has your life experiences um, in medicine and athletics taught you? Anything you can share on that? Well, yes. <laughs> um, so just as a bit of background, I've um, I've done tons and tons of action sports in the last, uh, you know, in, during my life, you know, barefoot water skiing, uh, competitive slalom skiing, uh, mountains are my favorite. Downhill skiing is my favorite sport. Wow. Skydiving, I've got about 600 skydives. Um, wow. You know, so, and then 12 marathons, a few half marathons. And, you know, so... <laughs> The, the, the training aspects are really the critical part mm -hmm. and you, and you learn very quickly, you know, especially in running that you have a plan and you stick to the plan mm -hmm. and how you feel, I mean, unless you're ill, but how you feel motivation wise really is immaterial. It means very little and that people don't change their lives and become you know, successful in sports or finance or business or get through medical school because they're motivated. Mm -hmm. they, they, they achieve those things because they actually build rituals into their lives. It's the rituals that really save you. It's mm -hmm. not so much the motivation because the motivation comes and goes. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing if you really want to be motivated, if you if you apply the ritual, you know, I get up at a certain time and I run a certain amount and I mm -hmm. go to the gym or whatever the case may mm -hmm. be. Once you start doing that and you start to see feedback from that, which, you know, sometimes takes three months, sometimes six months, sometimes less, then actually you become more motivated. I mean, it's very similar to if I want to feel more in love with May, I just do loving things to her regardless of how I feel. And then by magic, I'll feel loving. I'll feel more in love. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we put this cart before the horse where somehow we have to feel a certain way to do things. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. Cause if, if, if I only did the things I want, when I want, I'd be 300 pounds and drunk all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> so. mm -hmm. it's yeah. interesting when you asked about grit versus talent. Um, I just actually was, I had this really great conversation and a group that I'm in this training group. And what's is one of the topics that kind of came up in one of our weekly um, mindset classes, uh, really interesting studies. And, and I was like, oh, this is, this is interesting because uh, they talked about uh, data on athletes. This is all based on athlete stuff, but grit versus talent and how, you know, the studies. Uh, but it's true for most things. I mean, uh, most of the time, grit wins over talent because uh, unless you're the extreme Olympic athlete, then it's grit plus extreme talent. And then you get the, the superstars, you know, that are winning the Olympic medals or they're uh -huh. achieving crazy things like the Einsteins and Elon Musk of the world. Right. But for most day-to-day -day things, achieving um, life success, it really is like Tim said, it's grit. It's the determination to keep going. Um, you can have less talent than you know, your, your neighbor, or other person, but if they don't put in that time, the repetitive effort, mm -hmm. whether it's, it, whether it's your athletic goals, your, you know, if you're on a diet and exercise program, or you are on a quest, you're in university or college, and you're like this goal to become a lawyer. I'm not the smartest kid mm -hmm. in the class, but by gosh, I'm going to put the time in at the mm -hmm. library. I'm going to study extra. Um, that usually bodes further and pays mm -hmm. off. Is, right. the, is the, the hard work. And so, I mean, I learned that right from when I went to university, because I, I got to be the small fish in a big pond really quick when I came from small town where I grew up, but then it was the top of the class. And now I'm in this university class filled with all these other smart people. And mm -hmm. we saw it in pre-med, everybody wants to be a doctor. Everyone's like, oh, I'm in pre-med. And then the next couple of years, yeah, a few more would drop out. And then yeah. the people that were hanging in there were still going. And then a few more years, people would weed out and, and then you get your med school class. And then it's the same with even getting through and then who becomes the neurosurgeons or not. But so it's, it really is the, the grit and drive and determination and hard work can get you through a lot of things mm -hmm. faster than just thinking you're going to wing it on your own town. Yeah. Yeah. So you true. still need a baseline though. You do, I mean, of you know, course, like, of course, you know, yeah. there's still, there's still a baseline of, of, um, 
you know, intellect that you would need to go to medical mm-hmm. school or law school, of or what, whatever oh, right. the case may be. Yeah. Like, you know, I would be terrible. You know, we live in a logging community and, you know, I wouldn't be the greatest logger because I'm not a big, giant, strong guy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I could work in that and but it would be less I would be less good at it just because mm-hmm. physically I'm going to be right. limited by right. by my size to a certain degree. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the but learn but the ability to be educated and learn goes a long way. It does. a lot yeah. of dogs old heard yeah. old dogs new tricks. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm all about grit wins out over talent exactly. most of the time except on the extremes like i said you know yeah the yeah. case of you need both and then you're the top of the heap <laughs> right absolutely so um can you guys talk a little bit about you've probably seen a lot of COVID being an urgent care practice so can you talk about COVID on the front lines have what were the have, do you have any lessons learned that you can share with us wow yes we could be here all <laughs> week for you guys <laughs> yeah we um, were the front lines, all right. Um, by default, what mm. happened with us, the short, short summaries, we we were working at a, an urgent care clinic with this massive group that by default decided to restructure itself when COVID hit and have us urgent care docs, and there was what, 11 or 12 of us, um, become a centralized place that took care of anything that sounded like remotely COVID. Um, mm. first, first by phone, telehealth, we were doing lots of that. And then in person, and then over the two years that followed, uh, yeah, we got to become the sort of the experts because we were the ones that would be seeing and dealing with any signs and symptoms because mm-hmm. nobody wanted, wanted to do that. Um, and so we quickly got really educated and kept trying to stay educated with, and as Tim says, I think we learned more virology and immunology in the last two years by staying up on things and researching that we did ever in, in medical school. Um, oh no, by orders of magnitude. And uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I've probably so, read a thousand hour, hours on yeah. COVID and virology. And then we lost wow. her short after 18 months, we left that massive group and then joined a colleague as he established a clinic in our small hometown. Um, that was one of the few places in the state that had this massive allocation, sorry, monoclonal antibodies. And, we're not, we were not afraid to treat patients who actually had COVID when they were being turned away from. Wow. And so we got people from other states. So I don't know why you go ahead, Tim, and expand on kind of what well, we've learned from the if, whole thing. If you want a lesson from COVID, um, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the biggest lesson that, I, I, that I've probably learned is um, common sense is far more important than any scientific study or anything that the science is going to tell you. Mm-hmm. Can and, you expand on that? Yeah, because so so by definition, a pandemic is an evolving event. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this was it, the novel coronavirus is what it was originally called before they named it COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Or SARS, SARS-CoV-2, right? Because there was right. SARS-CoV-1, which was almost 20 years ago. Right. So so when you I I learned that if somebody was talking about COVID mm-hmm. and they were speaking with absolute certainty, they were manipulating you. Okay. And it didn't matter oh, what wow. you the, the vaccines are safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. Well, till they weren't. Mm. Right. Um, you know, this 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 might kill little kids. Well, it never did. I mean, mm. you know, there was just a handful. Mm. Right. And so I rapidly became. And this is people on either side of, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, one mm-hmm. physician I heard is a great line, which is the COVIDians and the COVIDians. Mm-hmm. So there were <laughs> people that were like, no, it's not, it's not real. It's all fake. There's no viruses, just like completely way, way off on one side. Mm-hmm. And then the other side where, you know, we're all going to die. This is the worst thing in the world. Just do whatever the CDC says. Well, you know, there's people speaking with this absolute total confidence, and, and right away, my BS monitor went, mm-hmm. you know, the BS tachometer went mm-hmm. to 10,000 RPMs because I'm like, it's an emerging event. You don't know what is going to happen. You don't know what it is. We don't really mm-hmm. know. We never figured out how to treat people in hospitals for at least six or seven months. We ventilated tons of people really mm-hmm. early, early in, in the pandemic. And that was the worst thing. You So, so um, I really get, uh, it has completely altered my perception of, of top down, highly bureaucratic, exceptionally competent experts. 
I, mm -hmm. I have a tremendous amount of, um, distrust, well, I should say, in just the idea that you follow somebody just because they're quote an expert. I think, I think that that's, and for us, it's hard. we, you know, for us in the field, seeing people on the front line, and I mean, there's a lot of people on the, obviously the front line, but the, quite a few of us were seeing different things than what people that are in bureaucratic and mm -hmm. clinical mm -hmm. positions or insisting. Um, the thing that was disappointing is that we weren't allowed or we were uh, many people being silenced um, or shunned or pushed off as being disinformation. Um, there was not allowed to be any dialogue when someone had some different kind of information, especially on mm. something that's evolving. It's new. It's right. like, well, right. we haven't seen, you know, we haven't been in this situation since something like the 1918 flu pandemic. So why not let everybody sort of share ideas, but the sudden, um, narrative of shutting down people, especially on social media platforms, information, anything that, that went against what the, uh, authorities were saying, um, that was really eye opening to me. And I thought, eh, you know, science, you should always be able to challenge science. Let us, even if the people that are suggesting an idea are are idiots or just a crazy thought, let them at least just put it out there and be refuted and it'll be shut down. But when you start shutting down ideas and thoughts, especially in science, then you start to really wonder, is there a big well, agenda? And, and you feed and, the crazy. And then it becomes very political, right? So right. You know, as soon as you start censoring, I mean, most people have enough common sense to know when someone's crazy. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or, or so out there with, with a motive to try to get rich or to be, you know, uh, provocative or however you want to say it, right. that, that as soon as you start censoring that person, well, then, then the, the, that crazy element, you're just pouring gas on that fire because it's like, well, why am I being censored? Well, because right. you're over the target. Yeah. Right. Well, you might be over the target. You might not, but we're never going to know unless we can have an open debate. And right. I, it, just, it, it was really astounding to us, mostly because uh, I share with people, Tim and I actually were two thirds of the way through the book. The Great Influenza by John Barry, which is about the 1918 flu pandemic. We mm -hmm. were listening to it on Audible, driving to work when this hit. It was just this crazy thing. And I looked at him in the news and I'm like, here we go. It's like 100 years. This is nuts. So we were in that book. And then as time evolved and we're in COVID, I said, why, why wouldn't they, you know, we're trying to come up with ways to keep people out of the hospital, keep people you know, not from sick and dying at home. Why would they let us throw every, not throw everything, but anything that's we know safe and not going to cause any harm to patients, let doctors treat their patients in the real world. Um, because back in 1918 and from the whole history of medicine as we've ever um, known or been doctors, doctors have always been allowed to try different therapies on patients to mm -hmm. keep them from being sick and dying from whatever. Um, this was much different. And all of a sudden we were banned from trying different therapies. Uh, you know, the big, I even hate to say it on here because the podcast might get censored if I say the big <laughs> H word or I word of medicine. But if you wanted to prescribe those, it was like, absolutely not. The pharmacists, at least in some states and the one we were in, would refuse to fill certain medications to give it a try. I'm like, this is insane. These these are used all the time. Why can't we try this on our patients? I really was, um, I, I, I just felt so disappointed that there was um, a lack of a lot of physicians who even wanted to take care of people when they were sick um, because they were so afraid of the, of COVID mm -hmm. and other, um, the authorities that would just silence anybody from any other ideas. So it's really been eye opening. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and we talk about it a lot on our own podcast and we've had various guests and, you know, without getting too in depth on it, I mean, the, the fear, I think from our fellow colleagues has really been disappointing. We've seen it firsthand of people sending patients away and saying, just go home. There's nothing I can do for you. Just stay home until you're sick enough to the, go to the hospital and then good luck. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, we don't do that. If someone's got pneumonia or the flu, you don't say just yeah. go home and lay there, um, to, uh, refusing to even try anything so yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting because it's something true. that i've thought about sort of fledgingly in the past because I, I sat on tons of committees and boards and 
you know, whatnot for most of my career. But, you know, we try to say that medicine is scientific when really the practice of medicine is far more about dogma and, and uh, obeying sort of authority. That's how you're trained. You know, you need to do what your attending physician says when you're a mm-hmm. resident or an intern, because otherwise you're going to be dangerous and kill people. Mm-hmm. So, so that, that makes sense in that situation until it completely doesn't make sense. Like, you know, we, start, we helped start this small clinic because these bigger hospital centers, big nonprofits, et cetera, they didn't want to see any sick people. And I'm like, okay, guys, this is a pandemic of, you know, since, you know, the biggest thing in the last century medically, we're doctors. This is our Normandy. You know, w- w- you know, you didn't get the Medal of Honor for sitting in the duck boat. You got the Medal of Honor for charging the beaches. And, and I'm like, we can't sit here and not see patients. Like, this right. is just crazy. Wow. You know, I saw this wonderful little girl. Her dad was a, you know, you know, police officer or something like that, you know, stalwarts mm-hmm. of the community. I can't get my kid in for an earache because it might be COVID. I'm like, well, that's just completely in- insane. Yeah. So we got our hands on monoclonal antibodies. We saw sick COVID patients. We treated them that day. You know, the clinics treated almost a thousand, you know, uh, COVID patients mm-hmm. in a town of 11,000 people. Wow. And yeah. because we were just, will- and, and people would come in, they'd say, why, aren't, why isn't anyone else doing this? And I said, I don't know. Because exactly. anyone can do it. Like you can just request the monoclonal shipments from the federal government. It comes through the state and they distribute it and you start IVs and you, it's not hard, but oh, it was wow. like this well, total even- unwillingness to actually step into the, you know, the fray. Well, what if I get shot? Well, you're a doctor, you might get shot, but this is when we're supposed to be taking the hits for the society. Right. Wow. I tell you. Hmm. So, and thank you. Thank you so much for your service, not only during <laughs> COVID, but um, in yeah, every day. I, mean, I, what I you're just doing. laugh. I feel like I do feel like kind of like a war torn. Yeah, head. yeah. Well, that's what I'm hearing because oh, yeah. I'm telling you, those um, certainly those are trying times. So, thank what, you for that. What, what's, you know, the thing is for us, I, I, the way I look at it is, yeah, this is what I signed up to do when right. I went into medicine. Um, right. And I'm never afraid of a virus ever before. I mean, I don't think this is like the zombie apocalypse or the black plague. And yeah, I did get COVID twice and I was pretty sick. The first one, we both had it like a bad flu, but I mean, uh, yeah, taking care of patients frontline. This is what I signed up for. What's really frightening is seeing people at home, you know, on telehealth bawling and having panic attacks and so afraid to leave their house that they think they are going to die to see kids lose everything because their social lives have been disrupted. They've lost high school years. People trying to make a living that can't go into work because of a triple secondhand exposure and the stigma. I mean, that's so disappointing to me. And also watching some of our colleagues just balk in fear. So anyway, um, that's been sad. Yeah. Yeah. So now, um, doctors, medicine has obviously evolved over the years. What advice and tips would you give someone interested in pursuing uh, a career in medicine today? And I'm asking this as a podcaster, but also Teresa's daughter is in medical school. So she's quite interested in your um, response to this question. Uh, My advice, my advice would be to avoid. Um, And again, this is coming from, you know, 30 years of battle wounds Mm -hmm. um, is to avoid the corporate medical structure at Mm. all costs, if possible. Mm. Um, You know, there's a lot of people just don't go into medicine. Medicine's (laughs) broken. No, no, medicine's not broken. Um, The fact that we have and and physicians did this. We own this. We, We essentially gave our autonomy away to multinational corporations. And and to big pharma and mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the list goes on and on. And there's ways, there is ways to practice medicine um, outside of uh, the corporate model. We actually a podcast that drops this week. We interviewed a wonderful young man who is a rheumatologist, and he um, is also doing a fellowship in uh, integrative medicine, uh, functional medicine. And he brought that into his rheumatology practice and he just takes cash. 
He's like, you know, I do lots of telehealth. So I have 15 state licenses. I'm just going to do this a different way. And, you know, he's being very successful. So, um, you know, if I had a lot of student loan debt, would I sign a corporate job for a while? Maybe, but I, it would never be, it would never be what I, what I did, which was, you know, we got into a corporate model that grew and grew and grew and grew. And then it's like, you're going to stay in that. I wouldn't, I would use it as a stepping stone if needed. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, it, it eats people. It it really, we used to get, I used to get so jaded. I was like, you know, what's with these doctors? They're, they they get out, they practice for five years and they're burned out. And I'm like, this is crazy. They're, they, you know, they're weak, they're millennials, they're whatever, you know, mm-hmm. derogatory term I could use. And then I started, you know, you start talking to these people and you see what they're, what they're stepping into right out of the bat without the experience that we have. And I go, yeah, I, I, I'd have been burned out in five years as well. And actually it might be a good thing because they're the ones that are going to change medicine. They're going to demand it. No one's going to do it otherwise. Mm-hmm. Wow. I would just, I totally agree with that and would piggyback on that, you know, from hearing a lot of with dismay, a lot of people that go in and get so disillusioned really early in the first five, 10 years or less is that, um, you know, if you, you go into this, I think sometimes there's still this thought that it's a medicine's like a lifestyle thing. There's good money, prestige. Uh, and I'm going to say, I think in the whole history of time, um, especially now with big corporate stuff, it, you have to look at it as a calling to serve people first. You can mm-hmm. get paid well in medicine. If you really want to get paid well, do dentistry or go into business or something else uh, that uh, requires less hours, less debt to get there mm-hmm. and um, a different lifestyle because you'll be disappointed. So it's not about the money and prestige at all. It has to be about serving people um, because then you won't be bitter about the hours you're spending, you know, when you're on call and someone holding someone's hand as they're dying and, you know, you're supposed to be at a party. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you're putting the people and the patients, I mean, sometimes first ahead of your family, even you have to do that. Uh, If you look at it that, and as well, it's a privilege to walk through people from birth through death with them, Mm -hmm. then you will have a fulfilling career. But Mm -hmm. if you think, oh, I'm good at science and this should be fun and, uh, you know, I can be a doc and make some good money and have a nice house car and there's there's better careers for you than than that. Yeah. Then go into cosmetic (laughs) surgery. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Guys, we've reached the last of the questions, but I would like it very much if you would share with us your uh, podcast and how people can get in touch and 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 um, listen more um, to what you guys are are sharing. Uh, yeah. So we started a podcast uh, last year. Funny how that happened right at the beginning, <laughs> and th- because of COVID, because people asking us questions, and so it's called BS Free MD, just like it sounds. BS. Yeah. <laughs> F-R-E-E-N-D. And it's on most major podcast platforms, mm-hmm. Spotify, Apple, etc. Our web page is the same, bsfreemd.com. Mm-hmm. And we um it's easiest to get a hold of us through our email on that page on our website, which is doc mm-hmm. doc at bsfreemd.com. Mm-hmm. And it's linked on our website. We are also on Facebook and Instagram as well. And people can message us through there, which they often do. So, okay. Very, very good. You guys shared a lot of good information with us and it was a great conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having All us. Right. Our pleasure. Always happy to share. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you. 